Thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you. Back when the secular literary specialists were including the Word of God as literature, they named the book of Ephesians as one of the best writings, the best done literature of all ages. Those of us who know Christ consider this not just as good literature, but as the very Word of God. Would you please find in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, there's a, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. If there is a thing those of us who are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ must do, it is to be on guard against the inculturation of the church. For there is a great danger that the church of our Lord Jesus Christ shall be more affected by the world than it affects the world. And this inculturation can mean then that we cease being the church of the Lord Christ and literally become the church of our culture or the church of the world. And the world needs so very much for us to be different than that. And yet there is the great danger that through the years there gathers people on Sunday morning who do not really see themselves as worshipers of Almighty God, but rather religious audiences uh, being performed for. There is a danger that those who need to see ourselves as stewards of life and time and things, understanding that we did not decide when we were born nor probably when we die, that everything we have is a gift from Almighty God, and we've stopped being stewards and oftentimes have become religious shoppers and spiritual consumers as we make our world, our church, more like our world. And I suppose that many of us would look at the church and say we would describe it as religious business instead of being a member of an army of God. For we like the image of business more than we like the image of war. And yet the Lord God has told you and me that we are indeed Christian soldiers. And while God's army must do its business well, it is not in, in the business to do the business that we have a purpose that is far greater than just getting larger and richer. We are here to tell the world about Jesus Christ, and we need to see ourselves as members of an army of God. And I think the apostle, as he is in Rome, a prisoner of Caesar, which means that he was under constant guard by the best young men in the Roman army, wanted to find a way to tell the Christians in Ephesus and other places this letter would be read, and through them, and because this has become a part of God's Word, to tell you and me who we are and what we are about and how we need to see ourselves as members of God's army, as his soldiers of the cross. And he looked at that Praetorian soldier standing guard over him, these were the best soldiers in the Roman army, therefore the best soldiers in the world. They were the best trained, the best conditioned, the best equipped soldiers of that day anywhere to be found. And the apostle looked at that young man. His body language spoke of purpose. The gleam in his eye made us understand that he knew why he was there and what his assignment was all about. Paul looked at the at the well-conditioned body, the young man who had muscles in places where most of us don't even have places. And he looked at his armor, the best equipped soldier of his day, and he said, God's people ought to have that kind of purpose. God's people should see themselves like that. God's people should be as spiritually conditioned as he is physically conditioned, and God's people do indeed have the best equipment to fight their battle as any soldier ever had. And so he wrote, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, 
take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, Words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is war talk, all right. There's no doubt he's talking war talk here. Words of battle, of struggle, of swords, of shield of strategy, of schemes, of an enemy. He's talking war here. There's no doubt about that. But let me ask you, you who are followers of Jesus Christ, do you see yourself as in a war? Do you really believe that you're involved in a war, that there is a kind of a battle going on, that there is a real struggle happening do you see yourself as the urgency of the word here says that you have a need to equip yourself fully with every bit of the armor of God so that when all of the battle is over and Satan's last scheme and arrow and fiery dart has been hurled at you when he has thrown everything at you that he can throw that when that is done you will still be standing do you see yourself in a war. And let me ask you this. Do you know what the war is about? If you're in a war, do you understand the war? Do you know what it's all about, this war? I recall as a six-year-old boy when World War II broke out that my half-brothers, who were all at least 10 years older than me, immediately volunteered to fight in that war. They were anxious to go. They wanted to go. Our whole nation rallied in that war because we understood it. We understood what the war was about. We understood what it would take to win it. We were committed to do the thing it would take to be victorious in that war. So all the people of this nation got behind that thing because we understood the war. It was a different time in Vietnam, wasn't it? because not everybody had a clear idea of what it was about. Not all Americans had a consensus about whether or not we should be in a war, whether it was a war to fight, or whether the war was even any of our business. And we had, we had conflict and problems, and we were weaker and not near so united and powerful because we didn't understand the war. Many of us didn't, didn't know what it was about. Do you understand what your spiritual war is about? Do you understand the purpose of this war that the apostle is speaking to us about? What's the objective? How do you know when you won a battle? How will you know when the war is over? What's going to happen when you're a victor in this war? What's the objective? We had in our high school football team a man whose name was, his nickname was Dirty. Had nothing to do with personal hygiene. It's just the way he played the game. Most everybody else on that team understood that the objective of that game was to either make or prevent touchdowns. I mean, we all understood, except Dirty. He thought the objective of that game was to hurt somebody. And he always measured how well he had played by how many people he had hurt. Tell me, do you know the objective of the game? Do you know what it's all about? Do you know what happens when you win a battle? Do you know what happens when the war is won? Do you understand the war? That's very important. It's very important because there's a lot of misinformation going around about the spiritual war now. There really is. There are some fine, well-written, fictional books that have some good truth in them that talk about the spiritual battle. But I fear that to those who try to get their truth from fiction and not from a very good nonfiction work that's available to tell you what the war is really about, they may begin to see this, this world as nothing more than just the arena in which the battle is fought. It's an arena where they, the, the, the good God with a capital G and his angels 
are battling the evil God with a little g and his demons. And they think that that's where the battle is taking place. It's, it's, the earth is nothing more than just an arena of that. The Word of God tells us that this world is what God made. And he said, this is good. This is good. This is my creation. The people in this world are my creation. You see, if we have a poor picture of the battle, if we think the battle is nothing more than the, than the great God with a capital G and his angels against the evil God with a little g and his devils, if we think that's all the war is about, that sort of excuses us from our sin, doesn't it? And the truth of God's Word is that God made the world and He made you and me and He loves us and we have sinned against Him. We have rebelled against Him and the evil in this world is not because of the little God and His demons but because of you and me. The evil and suffering in this world came because of the collective sins of people like you and me. And that makes our sins very, very important. And the war is about God reclaiming his world, reclaiming his people, bringing peace with God to those whose rebellion had robbed them of that peace. The war is about telling people about Jesus Christ. The war is about not, not getting one big group to beat another big group and claim a victory or to cast out this demon or to do that or have this great victory we claim over Satan. The war is about telling people about Jesus Christ. And he gives us these weapons. Now, he is God, and he gives us the weapons to fight the war. And they are weapons that sound strange. They're weapons like uh, feet being ready to go, faith, the Word of God, strange weapons, prayer. These are not the weapons that you would take to, to storm a university uh, English professor or to storm into a place to stop something from happening that you thought was wrong or to stop some multinational business from polluting the air. These are weapons for a different kind of warfare. And we need to understand there's a difference between the battle for civilization and the battle for the kingdom of God. Those are different battles. Now, Christians need to be involved in the battle for civilization. It's true. Christians need to be involved in politics because God is involved in all his world. We need to be involved in all his world too. But there is a difference between the battle for civilization and the battle for the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is about people having sinned and fallen and are hopeless and helpless and prisoners of sin and there is no hope for them throughout eternity unless they know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And if in your formula for life you have made the severe mathematical mistake of not figuring in the eternity factor. You have made a vast blunder in what life is about. Most of your life, the vast amount of our lives, nearly all of our lives is not in this brief digit of time, but is in eternity. And the spiritual war is about making peace with God through Jesus Christ and telling the world this is their only hope that they know Jesus Christ who came to the earth and who died for us. And the real battle was when Christ came to the earth that he loves. And on the cross, he stomped on Satan's head and defeated him. And he claimed the victory when he came out of the grave. And a battle is won every time a Christian goes somewhere to tell about Jesus Christ. The war will be won when Jesus Christ comes again and brings all of his people to himself. But that's what the war is about. The world really does need peace, the kind of peace that is the absence of war. The world really does need to be relieved from bad governments and relieved from evil decisions. The world really does need to understand morality and what works and doesn't work for people to be able to live together at peace. The world needs strong families. The world needs a lot of wonderful things. 
but the world needs more than anything else. More than anything else, the people of this world need peace with God and forgiveness of their sins and reconciliation with God. And that's what the spiritual battle is about. That's what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is about. That's who we are. There's a difference between the battle for civilization and the battle of the kingdom of God. And he gives us these weapons to fight the battle for the kingdom of God. He gives us weapons. He talks about putting on the full armor. And he says, put on the belt of truth. Truth is your weapon. Now the word says here that Satan schemes against us, plots plans his strategy. He cannot possess you against your will. He cannot make you do anything, but he will lie to you and tell you this is what it means to really have life. This is what it means to have fun. This is what it means to be great. This is what it means to be this or that. And he lies to you and you sin because you believe the lie. But it's your sin. It's not the devil making you do it. It's your sin. And you're responsible for your sin. And God says that God's people need to be equipped with truth. And his truth is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The truth is, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's your equipment. That's part of it. When he talks about the breastplate of righteousness, that which protects your heart and body, He's talking about righteousness, rightness, oneness. The word integrity could come from this. It means oneness. It means that you can't say, I believe one thing and live another way. You can't live against your beliefs, says the Sermon on the Mount, and be happy. You cannot live against your beliefs, says the Word of God, and be powerful as a soldier of the cross. You've got to put the breastplate of righteousness, of oneness, of integrity in place in order to be the soldier God calls you to be. He talks about feet. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about how important feet are to an army? They are. Those of you who have been in the army have heard those lectures. I remember in high school that our basketball coach, the first day we reported for basketball practice with a new coach, he taught us how to put on our socks so there'd be no wrinkles in them to cause blisters. He lectured us about taking care of our feet, about how to prevent athlete's foot. He made sure our shoes fit us and taught us for a long time how to take care of our feet because he said there's no re reason learning how to shoot if you can't get there to shoot. I remember the same lecture from our first sergeant in basic training at Fort Knox. At least I think that's what he said. He was from Brooklyn. I, I, I believe that's what he said. He talked about the boys choiping on the corner of Toyd and Toyd Toyd Avenue, but I believe he talked about taking care of your feet. In fact, I know he did. We need to get there with the gospel. We need to have feet that are willing to go where the gospel is needed, whether it be across the street or up the stairs or across town or around the world. It's important that we march where God would have us go. It goes on to talk about the head. How do you protect your head? So many people trying to get into your head in this world now, people dumping garbage in your head from every aspect in this world. How do you protect your head? He said, take the helmet of salvation. Know that Christ has saved you. Know that he is Lord. Know that he is your master. Know that you have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ and live on that and thrive that and reassure yourself of that. Take the assurance of your salvation as the helmet to protect your head from all the blows of the enemy against you. And then he talks about two offensive weapons. Two offensive weapons. What are they? The word and prayer. These are your offensive weapons. The word and prayer. Do you remember in Acts 6-2 when there was a problem in the church over people thought they were being slighted and it was causing difficulties with the fellowship that the apostles in this brand new multi-thousand church made a decision and then they said this to back up their decision and the whole church voted to, to reaffirm this. They said, as leaders of the church, the thing we must give ourselves to is the ministry of the word and of prayer the offensive weapons of the soldier of the cross. The Word of God. How important is the Word of God to you? How important is it in your life? 
We had a testimony at the close of the 940 service in which one of our young people, not so young, has gone off to seminary. He talked about the same experience I had in my first year in seminary, and that is how much he learned to love and understand the power of the Word of God, about how God's Word can literally change your life and infuse you with power because it's His Word and it's real and He makes it so. You remember in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, the apostle is telling Timothy, when civilization is decaying and when the church is weak and unhealthy and dying, here's how it will be. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, but treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. All right, he said, Timothy, a civilization around you is like that. It is dying. It is diseased. In the church, there is a form of godliness but no real power of God. What do you say to people like that? What do you do? What do you say, Timothy, I'm going to give you some great new program, some new method of evangelism. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate spiritual gifts so you can do wonders and signs and miracles and tricks and people will, will see your spirituality and they'll be drawn to that. I'm going to teach you how to cast out demons. I'm going to teach you how to be a spiritual giant. What does he say? But it's for you. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In John 6, in verse 62, Jesus said, My words are spirit and they are life. In John 17, 17, remember Christ is praying for his apostles and he's also praying for you and me because in that prayer he said, I pray not only for them, but I pray for all who will believe because of them. And in John 17, 17, he prayed for you and me. Father, sanctify them by thy word for thy word is truth. Sanctify means to make you what you're supposed to be in the mind of God. He said, Lord, do it through your word. In Hebrews 4.12, the word says there, for the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword who can trim away the things that ought not to be in us and make us what we ought to be. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 23, he says, you remember you were born again, not by incorruptible seeds, but by the living word of God. You've been born again. In Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. There the prophet is saying, and God is saying through the prophet, just as I send the rain and the snow and it comes to earth and it doesn't return to the sky till it's done what I've, what I've sent it to do. That is, it, it produces seeds for the sower, it produces food for the people who are hungry. He said, even so, I send my word and it doesn't come back to me until it has accomplished its purpose. The word of God is alive and powerful. How much do you see the Bible, the Word of God, as your weapon to do the things that you need to do as a soldier of the cross. It is not hard to discern that in fellowships who call themselves Christians, that where the Word of God is loved and learned and obeyed and followed and taught, there is growth and there is spiritual growing and, and there is life. But in those fellowships where the Word of God is not so revered and honored, in those fellowships that say we base what we do upon some sort of subjective experience or upon some kind of fellowship that is less than fellowship in the Spirit, then there is, there is decline and there is weakness and there is a form of godliness that denies the power of God. The Word of God is God's word for you and me. And the word of God tells us about Jesus coming. 
tells us that his purpose in coming was to tell people about the kingdom of God. The first thing the Bible says about the ministry of Christ was that he came preaching. In Mark 1, 38, we read that, that Jesus was making a, a big impact in Capernaum. He'd gotten up early in the morning, as he usually did, went out somewhere to pray very early. His disciples caught him praying, and they said to him, Lord, the people are anxious to see you. They love you. They want to see you back in Capernaum. And he said, let's go to some other villages so that I may preach to them also because this is why I came. And then a little bit later in Mark 2, 2, it says he came back to Capernaum, that he came to the house there where they usually met, probably Peter's house, and that the people crowded around so much they couldn't see, and Jesus, the first line says, and Jesus preached to them the word of God. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. And the word of God is our offensive weapon. And prayer, and prayer. Paul says, pray. Pray for each other. Pray on every occasion. Pray at all times. Pray every kind of prayer you can think of. And then he says, pray for me. And what should we pray for him? Remember, Paul's in prison. He's about to be beheaded. He doesn't have anything. He's given up everything to follow Jesus Christ. What are we to pray for him? That he might get free, that he might get rich, that he might become able to go out and do some more? What do we want to pray for Paul, that he might be easy? He said, pray for me that every time I open my mouth, I speak the words of the mystery of Jesus Christ. That is the secret that the world must know, and that is that God loves them and wants to save them. He said, pray for me that I tell the world about Christ. What is the war about? It's about telling the world about Christ. It's not about beating the devil. It's not about beating the demons. It's about telling the world about Christ. You remember in Acts 4, after the, uh, some of the apostles had been arrested and they were brought before the Sanhedrin, the most powerful people of its day, and they were released, but they were released with a threat. And that threat was, you say any more about this and you're in big trouble. And they went back to their group and the Word says that they prayed. It's an eloquent prayer in Acts 4, whoever led that prayer for that church. But the first thing they asked for was this, Oh God, grant us that we may speak your Word with boldness. For that's what we're about. The war is about telling the world about Jesus Christ. Satan's greatest desire is to keep you and me from telling the world about Jesus Christ. Christ. That's what it's about. The world needs a lot of things. And I think in the battle for civilization that we'd want to be in, get involved. The world needs peace, that the absence of war. The world needs morality. The world needs a lot of things. But the world needs most of all, most of all, the world needs peace with God. And that comes only as God's people Understand the difference between the battle for civilization and the battle for the kingdom of God. And for us, the primary battle is for the kingdom of God. And that means we are soldiers who get ourselves in spiritual shape, who make ourselves as conditioned as we can be, and who understand that our purpose is to use all the armor of God so that the world may know that Jesus Christ has come and died for them and wants to give them life. Or there's no hope. There's no hope. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? I'm going to ask you now, you who say, I am a Christian, I belong to Jesus Christ, tell me, why do you live? What is the purpose of your life? Does it match anything that God's Word has said to us today? Is that why you live? Is that the purpose of your life? Do you belong in a Christian fellowship? Do you see yourself as a soldier? of the cross. Would you ask God to help you be the kind of soldier of the cross that he would have you be? You may be thinking of someone you know who doesn't know Christ, and this is the most critical thing. Being destitute, not having money, not having food, not having clothes is not near so destitute and tragic a thing as not having Jesus Christ. You may know someone without Christ. Maybe you'll want to bring them the carols by candlelight. Pray for them. 
Talk to them. Talk about the music that you hear and talk about the witness that you can expose them to. Maybe you'll find other ways. And let's begin to fight the war that God has sent us to fight. Father, I ask you now to guide us. Lord, bless our church. God, revive us all. Revive me and make me what I ought to be. And, oh, God, may it not be said of a church you have blessed so richly and wonderfully that we have a form of godliness but deny its power because we forgot who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask those of you who would make professions of faith or tell us that you want to know about Jesus Christ when we begin to sing, uh, would you just stand up and walk down to the front and let us know about that? Hundreds in this room have already done that, and maybe this is your day, and we'd be greatly encouraged to see you come and make that kind of decision. So would you do it? Dear Christian friends, maybe you want to be a part of this church family, and you feel like God's leadership in your life may lead you here. And you know he wants you to be a part of a local church and to be active because the church is the only New Testament way that Jesus gave us to do his work and to be the soldiers of the cross that he called us to be. So we'd love to have you in this fellowship. We'd love to have you as a part of this church. So just get up and come when the music begins and maybe your decision will encourage others. But whatever our Lord would have you do, rededication, giving your life to him for some particular task in kingdom service, whatever it is, just as we all are seated, when the music begins, those of you who would make public decisions just stand and walk to the front and we'd be happy to greet you. Let me ask you that no one leave. This is a very serious time. If you believe in God and you believe God is here, then please listen to him and let him tell you what you need to hear in this very special part of this worship service to honor our Lord God. We encourage you to do whatever pleases him. The music will begin now and we'll just wait for you to come and make that public decision that honors him.